Okay, Snow King Beekeepers Association monthly meeting, July 20th, 2022. And we're going to present for a little while on the topic of various ways to raise queens while controlling forced swarms and increasing honey production and some other useful items. My son said I have to put this disclaimer in, so I've got the disclaimer. I'm not pretending I took all these pictures. Journeyman service hours. Thank you, Steve, for asking about that right before we started. Um, just you do need the apprentice certificate before you are really supposed to count your journeyman service hours. If you don't have your apprentice certificate, give me a, a, a call or an email and we'll work something out. Because this is kind of a new requirement. It, it's catching people by surprise. Um, oh, service, meeting, recordings. We're going to put this recording on the YouTube channel. The extractors are available for loan. Corinne is here. You can always catch her on the chat if you want to reserve an extractor. Make sure you've got her email. And Sandra is up in Granite Falls by the hive side in Granite Falls at Ron's place, Ron Robinson's. And both Corinne and Sandra have the Northern Giant Hornet traps. Asian Giant Hornet has been renamed. There are a couple of different Asian Hornets, and people are getting confused. And the one that we are worried about is the Giant. And it's, they're going to call it the Northern Giant Hornet. Also, people didn't want to be making derogatory comments about Asia. I don't know. I blame lots of stuff on them. Apis Serana um, gave us the, ver the Varroa and gave us the terrible form of Nosema. I don't know. But that was the B. And I want to make sure I finish everything by probably, I might, might even finish by 7.30 what I'm saying. But I, we stay and we talk bees forever. Hands-on hive sites. Please, please come to these. If you, you, there is some question you want to ask, you will learn something. And just watch somebody else screw things up for a while, okay? Hey, love to talk to bees. If you come out, if you want to do oxalic acid, this is my MK350, which is the budget version of the Pro Vape. You just zap, 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 go through the hives, doing them in like a minute a hive instead of uh, it taking until you put insert the wand and you wait so long and then it has to cool down before you put it in the next one, in the next hive. This is the intermediate way to do it. If you get a half dozen hives, this is so nice. You just drill a hole. You don't have to go in the front of the hive like this. This must be an online picture. I've got a better picture of my own, I should find. You go through a hole in the back, and you drill it into your bottom board. Works out great. The conference is coming up. More journeyman service credits if you'd like to help. We have a booth there. It will be online and in person, in case you're not interested in going to Othello. You sign up for this. On our Sign Up Genius site, which was in the newsletter, the fair, again, the Sign Up Genius site, and really the fair is our biggest social event of the year. This is really, at least come by and say hi. And you can hang out for a while with beekeepers, and you could do a, a three-hour shift and, and get some credit. And the first 40 people who sign up, if you sign up by August 1st, Becky Glaze is a textile designer and she's offered to make the t-shirts. And I didn't get the picture of the lot. She's working on what picture of a bee she's going to put on there. And then Snow King Beekeepers. She's going to go, I think, for yellow and then a black print on it. Okay. So what we really, I promised to talk about, I really promised to talk about was queen raising. And you already know, so large, queens are the largest bee. They live the longest, even though they're not living as long as they used to. That's a whole other talk. You want information on that? Ask me. A lot of people are, are writing and, and presenting on that right now. And she can lay that thousand eggs per day. And the workers at this time of year can take them away and cannibalize them, make them disappear while they stuff nectar into those brood cells instead. Happening to most of us. She has a very complicated physiology. We don't want it damaged in any way, but it does get damaged, and then she gets superseded or she fails to lay as well. 
and, and any number of things can happen to her because her physiology is so complicated. She doesn't control the high, but I love the diagram on the on the upper right where it shows all the things she affects. She affects everything, but she doesn't get to play the monarch. In other languages, she's called the mother. And in, I think that's a lot of ways that's a better term. I mean, mothers are always trying to influence, influence their children. We often don't succeed, but we still are influencing and nudging and encouraging. Sometimes discouraging. And we talk a lot about the strains. But if you've already found yourself in the position of buying two queens, supposedly of the same strain, from the same supplier, and they don't act at all alike, you understand that most of our bees are really mutts. There really isn't, unless you get an artificially inseminated, and then you could queen, possibly you can get really close to a purebred in the Carniolan Caucasian Italian. Russian, you can get very close because there is a Russian Bee Breeders Association that actually sells uh, stock, sometimes not that expensive. One person said if you ordered a certain number, they were actually willing to ship them at one time of the year for about 100 each. Most of what we get, though, is part. And when we find a queen we like, like I found two that I really like, and I would like to get offspring off them. Before I get discouraging, because I'm going to talk about our weather and, and the problems we've had, we were already talking some about that. Just keep in mind, Washington has now made it onto the top 10 honey-producing U.S. states. In 2021, we made it. Believe it or not, it says in 1,000 pounds. So I think that means we put out 3 million pounds of honey, reading this the way I think it reads. So I thought that that's encouraging. And we have those long days. Um, this is actually the winter solstice. We get really short. But on the summer solstice, as you noticed, we get really long days at the time when hopefully we have peak population and our bees are out there foraging the peak blackberry flow, which has stopped being rained on. However, there is a certain amount of temperature dependence to all this, and we didn't hit the right temperatures early this year. So this is out of Samatero and Avitavoli, the beekeeper's handbook. Recommend eventually, if you stay in beekeeping beyond a year or so, you'll find you really need this book, the beekeeper's handbook. It has a lot of diagrams like this. This is very discouraging when I look at the temperatures. Um, I, you know, queens were trying to mate at less than 68 degrees. No wonder I ended up with a drone layer and, and uh, two with spotty brood pattern. Hey, the, the amazing thing is that two of them got any mating done. Um, the drones can't even get up there until 61, supposedly. I think we have bees who make it up there earlier than that, like, lower temperatures than that. But it is kind of discouraging that it's hard when you're in the 40s for daytime highs in March going into April. We finally made it into the 50s. It took forever to get to the 60s as a daytime regular high. So we are kind of fighting that. We are a cool maritime climate. And the completely unpredictable weather results in Failure to mate within the window. The six to ten days post-emergence for a queen would be her ideal window. She can still mate after that, but they say if she hits like a month and she hasn't mated, forget it. And the only way you know that is to wait for her to mate and then watch her brood pattern after she starts to lay. It, and I wasn't the only person that was having trouble with drone laying queens. I uh, found one in another hive. Saw one la last year also. So there are phenomena that happens. And if we don't get a queen into that hive, she fails to come back, we end up with laying worker development if we're not watching our hives. Okay, so we have a lot of other problems with our climate. We have the problem of chilled brood. If we make our splits too early and the, and the temperature drops, the sudden chill when the brood nest is expanding and there's not enough workers coming in at night to hold the temperature at that 91 to 9, yeah, about 90, 92 to 94 degrees, right in there. Almost body temperature that bees need so that they can finish developing. And 
Chill Brood is a setback to the hive and a stress. Now, we have the problem of we only have overwintered queens available until we get the shipments. The commercial people get their shipments first. Then the bee supply places around here get their shipments, which may be April or later. And we do a lot more feeding to get our bees going and keep them going when it's raining too hard for them to get out, even though we have great pollen sources and some nectar, especially the maple flow. But that got rained on this year. So when we're looking for a queen raising method, I was trying to figure out where we go wrong in the ways we're trying to do it. We need something that's suited to Western Washington and to a cool maritime climate. We need the most successful methods that will help us in our cool, damp springs, which are most of our springs. We need to not take up too much space if we're hobbyists, especially if you're urban and your neighbor looks over the fence and you start splits and they see more hives than the two or four or whatever you're allowed by the city ordinance. Or just you promised you would only have like two hives and they're getting nervous when they start seeing extra side-by-side -side hives, even if they're small. To them, it's still a full hive if they see a top board and a bottom board. If we could reduce the amount of equipment we need, every time we make a split and have to get another top board, another bottom board, and plus the boxes and frames, if we, that's expensive. And for the hobbyists, that's a problem after you've already spent like that 1500 to get started your first year. You need a return on your investment. And it would be nice when we find out that the split is queenless, uh, if we can find the drone layer and pincher, or a really bad, poorly made a queen with that spotty brood pattern, if we could just pinch her out and recombine easily, that would be wonderful. If we could figure out a way to overwinter the queens, keep some in reserve, and, or maybe have some for sale when we're raising queens, that would be really neat if we could just find a way to just ease and make it easy, keep it simple and smooth. And it would be nice to have independence from those out-of-state queen suppliers for a number of reasons. Uh, supply chains have been a problem. They blame weather sometimes. Sometimes they blame supply chain. And we are the lower priority. I mean, the commercial beekeepers have their, their contracts in early because they need their queens. Some of them they need in like January, February. And they are dependent on out-of-state and they get priority. So here we are trying to make sure that we have a queen at the right time so we can build up peak population. Our ideal is first we got the nuke, nukes the first year. But after that, we're hoping that we will overwinter with a little bit stronger hive and maybe maybe more like 15, 20,000 going through the winter, coming out and building up rapidly because they've got that, that overwintered advantage. And if we could peak right at the blackberry bloom, that's our goal. If we lose a queen somewhere in here at a critical time, the offspring that she would have produced that would have built up that population isn't happening. On the other hand, if we don't make some kind of population control, splits or whatever, equalizing, taking excess population out of one hive and moving it to a, another hive that's worth boosting. A weak hive isn't always worth boosting. And that's a difficult thing to decide. Even after years of being a beekeeper, you still try to keep weak hives alive sometimes, and you shouldn't. But we don't want that swarm because there that blows the whole peak during the peak honey flow. Okay, so we're we've got all these problems we're facing. And then you get people like me giving you advice. And it is important to remember that a beekeeper is an individual who does precision guesswork based on unreliable data provided by those of questionable knowledge. So, this is an Eli opinion. But what I have found is that beekeepers, they start, and I tell them not to do queen excluders and things like that. We were talking about that the first year. Because it usually causes more trouble than it helps. But it's interesting how beekeepers evolve over their first year of beekeeping and into their second and third. 
The first year they pay for the queens. If they have to buy replacement queens, they might complain about the price. And then they say, well, I could make a walkaway split. A walkaway split being you just divide the, the, the hive in half. You can do it in rather poor weather, which this year, for example, you could do it in poor weather because you're just taking half the resources of the hive and putting them in one stack and half the resources and put them in another stack. You do need another bottom board, another top board, but you just split it half and half. You don't even have to know where the queen is. And hunting for the queen when it keeps starting to rain on you every time you go out in your hives is difficult. Okay, so this is, it's not a bad method, but you've made two small hives now. You have to get them back up to where you can take advantage of that peak honey flow, right? And you may already be missing out on like the Aprilish big leaf maple flow. So, but it's an easy split to do. I think everybody who's a beekeeper does it within the first year or two. After you've done that, you and you just make sure there's eggs in both, cat brood in both, resources in both, you should make them fairly equal. And then if one is much stronger than the other, because the one with the queen usually is stronger, and the one that has to stop and take the eggs to make a queen, they're temporarily queenless, that one may need boosting later. So you may have to equalize between those two splits. There's two, the two splits you made off the one parent high. So after a while you go, well, I'm only gonna take five frames off, especially when the weather gets a little warmer. Any split is an artificial swarm. And so if you found swarm cells, you can do it, pull the swarm cells out. You can do it preemptively before you see swarm cells, but you know that hive stack is getting too big, too fast. So you say, okay, I'll do it now instead of letting them swarm right before the, the flow. I'll end up with two, at least medium sized hives. Or even better, you purchase a queen. You figure out, you take a purchase queen, you make up the five frame split, just like the nuke that you got when you were a beginner, uh, maybe two frames of brood, two frames of stores, and maybe another frame of, of either. And if it's a purchase queen, you wanna make sure she has some place to lay, so maybe one frame that's empty. The workers can prepare for her to lay in. And that takes less of the resources off the main hive. So your main hive, if you only take five frames off, may still be on track to be pretty good for honey production. Honey production may not be your only goal, but it is an important one. Okay, after you've tried that, now you're gonna do the improved walk, walk away, maybe, and Make sure that you know which one has the queen in it and get the extra resources to the one that does not have a queen that you're expecting the workers to raise a queen for you. And with the weather we had, this is where you end up with drone laying queens and poorly mated queens with spotty brood patterns. You can bolster your queenless, because it's going to be the weaker hive, by turning your entrance 180 degrees around. That's so you're doing more things now. You're coming along as a beekeeper. You're sort of evolving. And you start maybe making smaller nukes. You might try something called a queen castle where a, a hive body is split into two, three, even four with divider walls and separate entrances. And you could put swarm cells in each one, for example, or purchase queens, but you could raise more queens at the same time. There's, I, I called it resource hive. I think it's now called a support hive. And you can put basically two nukes in the same 10 frame hive body with a divider. I have a picture of that coming up. And you might be using some of these to keep your swarm cells in re reserve or you're requeening and you want to keep the old queen for a while to make sure that the new queen's really good. Or you just don't have enough equipment to keep queens and full-sized hives and hive bodies. And about this time, you stop complaining about the price of queens because you have discovered the queens are starting to look like a deal. It's a lot easier to go out and get one if you can get a good quality one. Part of the problem is you start doing these splits and look, you started out with this nice two, you promised everybody you'd just have two hives, you promised yourself you'd have two hives, and before you know it, you're doing splits. 
and you're ending up with a lot of smaller hives. And then before you know it, you could be the bottom pitcher. That's not unusual for people their third year, fourth year to go too big. I hit 12 and out apiary and said, I don't want to do this. It's not fun. So I backed off and I keep saying, I'm only going to have four. And then I have six and then I make splits so I can stock the uh, Sultan hive sides in other place and help other people out. But I keep saying, I'm going to keep it down. So that, that amount of space that things take, sometimes you can cut it down by doing, here's a picture of a queen castle, mating box, separate entrances. Um, there's a divider between each of these three sections, okay? This is used a lot. There's a grafting frame behind it because a lot of people, that's part of what they're doing is, is putting grafted queen cells in there instead of relying on swarm cells. And um, some people do these little mini mating nukes. That, again, trying not to end up with a whole hive for a queen that isn't proven yet who might turn out to be a dud. Different systems. This is the bottom of what I was calling it a resource hive, but it's actually a support hive. And you could have two, basically four or five frame nukes side by side. And this is nice because they're sharing a top, a bottom, and the heat. Going through the winter or coming out of the winter, the bees on each side will pull toward the center. And it's like the cluster is divided in half by the wall, which keeps two different queens separate. So you can get two queens, hopefully in the spring, but if you lost one, you won't lose the entire hive because you'll still have one queen for that large box. So people use nukes, that saves some space, but your neighbors are gonna think that you've got a whole bunch more hives than you promised. And there's a lot of queen raising where you say, can I wait for a queen to be raised by the workers? And this is out of Larry Connor, but I did put it at the bottom. Larry Connor, she can't read it. He is uh, Queen Essentials or Increase Essentials. This is his chart. If you want a good way to reach this, this information, go to Rusty Burlew's honeybeesuite.com, her blog, and she's got a great blog. Her website is so neat. You type in what you're looking for in the search bar, and you can find things like queen replacement, um, queen timelines, queen development. Also, this is a pictorial over on the left, a pictorial idea of what you're looking at. We have a short beekeeping season, and that's why I keep putting this in is, do you really want to wait to raise queens? And it's okay to say no. And you may say, but I really like the queens I've got. I want queens off that. Having extra queens in the spring, if you realize your hive is queenless in late fall or spring, maybe February, March, and you don't have a replacement queen, or in the case of that hive with the divider that you could lift out and recombine the, the two hives and, and, and merge them together without even opening up the hive. If you don't have a plan, every time you lose a queen, you've lost that colony. Now there's a number of strategies to avoid this. Some people requeen every hive every year. It's actually, there are people that do that. And some do every other year. And that way they have a younger, more robust queen going into the winter. And some people have these strategies where they're overwintering extra queens. Oh my, sorry, I went the wrong way. Okay, you've tried these different methods and that's when grafting starts coming up. There's disadvantages and advantages to it. You get a lot of queens, but the problem is you get them when anyone can raise queens, so you can't really usually sell them, but you can pick the, the queen you wanted to graft her eggs. You wanted to graft off her. That's my hope. I have two queens I really want to do that with. It's one of my next steps. So there's no really demand for them, so it's not really easy to sell them. You need some specialized equipment and you need something. I don't have time to go into it tonight. I think it would be boring. But you need to have a cell builder. When you do this grafting, you take these queen eggs, put them in the cup. I have a couple pictures for people who've never thought about grafting. There's a picture coming up. It's particularly used with something called a cloak board. 
if you have to dedicate whole hives to cell builder, which is a queenless, at least temporarily queenless hive that the queen can't get to, never can get to, but there's not even queen pheromone there, and you have young worker bees, young nurse bees, that take really good care of whatever eggs you put in there in a queen cell cup. And then you have to also have them finish up those hives and protect those queen cells. Some people use an incubator. It starts to get complicated. You start needing more equipment. As you tie up hives to do this, you're decreasing your honey production. You're tying up resources. The same problem you have if you end up with a lot of splits and they're too small to really ever produce surplus honey. But with grafting, you've picked the queen you wanted the offspring of. You're keeping extra queens in reserve. You've got all these extra swarm cells. Because uh, that's what you're doing. They're grafted cells. I should call them graft cells, not swarm cells, but they're queen cells. And if you want to do annual requeening, good. If you want to have extra queens to overwinter for spring, this is one way to get them. But sometimes I feel like Winnie the Pooh, and I used to read this a lot to my kids, and in children's literature, there's a lot of truth. Is there another way? Is there a way that might be easier for the hobbyist beekeeper who doesn't have a lot of real estate, doesn't want to buy a lot of specialized equipment? Is there an easier way to get queens? And when you need them, and have them when you need them. And in Winnie the Pooh, there's a poor Winnie the Pooh. He, he's a bear of little brain. He's always trying to figure things out. And here he is coming down the stairs now, bump, bump, bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. But sometimes he feels there is another way, if only he could think of it. And that's the way I felt about queen raising and grafting and all that. Is there a better method? Is there something that for the hobbyist and small-scale beekeeper would be low real estate, low resources in equipment, won't tie up my equipment bees so that I lose honey production, that works in this cool maritime climate with our, with our springs, and there's other areas that are using the methods I want to talk about, and we can raise and we can have in reserve queens at all seasons, and also gives you swarm control and controls the size of the brood nest, which the queen excluder is used a lot for. But it's a little tricky controlling the size of the brood nest. The bees have to not feel congested. And now that I've done Demaray, I understand why it works, why I can control the size of the brood nest. You can put the queen in half the size that she would naturally expand to, but you have to do a little maintenance. You keep making sure that she has space to lay by taking brood out and moving it away from her. And you also, while you're doing this, can be making splits and nukes. Not losing your honey production. So there are three methods, and I've been very confused for years by these names. These names keep popping up. Beekeepers that have been beekeepers very long in this area use them. And in the UK and in the Northeastern United States, in cool, maritime, northern type climates like ours. And these names come up and I couldn't get what it was about. I think I finally understand it. All of them actually overlap. You will hear one called a queen raising method, one called swarm control, and one's to increase honey production. And they all are lower equipment cost and lower real estate. For as, as I was saying, for hobbyists or especially backyarders or very small scale, suddenly this becomes a lot more attractive. They're vertical systems. They actually are what you are doing when you spread out and do horizontally do your splits. But because you're not going horizontally, you need less real estate, you need fewer top and bottom boards. You do use three tools. The Demaray uses the Queen Excluder. And to a certain extent, the others use it. But that's all the Demaray needs. The cloak board is this one on the lower left, and it has a slide-out solid sheet. Otherwise, it's a queen excluder underneath. And it has the kind that I really hate. But that one I was talking about that I think it goes the wrong way, and sometimes bees. But you're using this on a populous hive with drawn comb above and below. 
So it's not, it shouldn't cause that problem. But the solid sheet is to completely block queen pheromones for 24 hours, maybe a little longer. And you use it especially when you're doing grafting so that you don't have to take another entire hive and turn it into a cell builder. A cell builder hive has to have a lot of nurse bees and no supersedure cells there except for what you put in if you're putting in graft cells and no queen pheromone or reduced so low in level that the bees go, oh, we're queenless. We need to raise out these eggs that we're putting in these little cell cups by the beekeeper and put right there for us to raise as queen cells. So that's the one that has the solid board and that's why it has a solid board. If you're a grafter, you should have a cloak board. That's the way I did it and I gotta admit it saved a lot of trouble. And then you don't need to keep this solid sheet in. You can pull it back out after the queen cells are well established. The, the workers have decided to raise them out. And you still have the queen excluder and you have all the advantage of a large populace lots of resources high that you haven't split into two small ones and stressed it with that. The snail grove is a little more complicated. That one is the hardest one to understand and what a lot of people do is it has three little entrances here. They just use one of these three tricky things. That one I don't know if I can explain but we have a monthly meeting where Michael Jaros came and explained it and that's when it finally made sense what the Snell Grow Board was supposed to do. It is screened, it's not an excluder. The other two are excluders. So there are bees passing through and they're carrying a certain amount of pheromone. There's a lot of heat moving through. You're getting the advantage of a large populous hive. So when you go horizontal, you don't have to worry about the stacks getting too high. And it is easier to, it reduces the weight that you're lifting. You can get to the feeders and, fr feeders and frames more, more easily. So it's, it's not really going to work when you need to be feeding top and bottom. With the snail grow board, that would be a problem because it's screen. For the excluder methods, it's not going to be a problem to put the feeder on top or at the side of the top if it's an inline feeder. A horizontal does take up all that space. It takes up more resources in equipment and you need a certain number of bees in each hive and now they are dedicated to raising queens. You also need storage space to put all the equipment in when you're not using it. And it looks like more colonies to your neighbors. Now if you go vertical with these three methods, the Demaray, the Cloak, and the Snell Grove, they take up less space. They actually take up fewer resources you're reusing the same bees in a lot of ways, getting a, that critical mass of bees that is a thriving colony, not just surviving, but thriving. You've got less equipment to buy and store, even though you are buying three things. Well, the Demery, you already have the queen excluders. Usually when people buy kits, they often have those just given to them. But the cloak board is a little different. You could make that slide out board. You could make a cloak board and the snail grove that would be a little complicated to make, but some people do. Fewer bees and it looks like fewer colonies. Then when you get to overwintering, what I'm going to explain kind of makes it make sense that you're also going to be able to keep them separate. If you had to put every queen in even a five frame nuke and try to figure out how to protect from wind and help them share the heat somewhat by wrapping them together, this is a very interesting article on how to do that. But you could have a queen every five frames instead of having one queen for your two deeps, 20 frames. You can get a lot more queens through the winter this way. And this is if you were to divide a 10 frame high and put and keep it divided all the way up, you can have a queen on each side, two queens. So already this is an improvement. You're getting double the queens if you if you get enough queens and you can overwinter them. So how does this work? They all are basically the same idea. In all three systems, you rearrange the, the populace, take a, a thriving high populace, and you put the queen in the bottom. That's the most important thing. You move a lot of brood to the top. In the, in the 
Demery and in the Snellgrove, you're trying to get the the brood away from the queen, getting her in the bottom, and you give her just some a little eggs and larvae with her so that the workers are down there working with her. You give her a lot of empty, this blank white space is empty, can be drawn out comb, but it could be absolutely you want it drawn out comb. And then you separate her with those workers by distance mostly, but also a queen excluder from the rest of the cat brood. And you actually take the cat brood a whole bunch of bees and you put them all the whole bunch of brood and put it at the top. If you use a queen excluder, then she can't cross and you can raise queen cells in the top. Or you could remove the queen cells if they appear. If you don't want supersede your cells, which is what will happen because the queen's pheromone isn't getting through. It, she, most of her pheromones are actually tactile. She actually passes them by contact by the six tarsal, the glands on her six feet, her tarsal glands, her mandibular glands, her retinue that surrounds her and constantly changes. She And she's patrolling around the hive, the brood nest. Okay. That can't go through the queen excluder. Then you eat, you can put the honey supers, and especially what works really well for swarm control is you've given her lots of room to lay, and then right above the queen excluder, you put a box that is not full. It has room. The workers that are down here with her, even if she lays this up, they go, there's lots of room. There's still lots of room, and they work on this. Uh, they start working above, pulling out comb, drawing it out. And um, it, they can't put brood in it, but they're not really aware of that. And this becomes a honey super. And you start adding honey supers after this system gets set up. Every once in a while, you should probably go down and check the queen, like every few weeks, and make sure she still has room to lay and that the bees have not gone back and backfilled all of that. I hope that makes sense. It, it, the idea is the queen at the bottom and most of the brood moves to the top. And every once in a while you renew this if you want to maintain this through the season. On a snowgrove board, you're doing the same thing, but you're making sure that you do the same thing with the queen is down here with very little brood, lots of room to lay. You put an excluder, then honey supers in between. And there's also a double screen to make sure there's less of the pheromone gets through. Heat gets through the screen, but, and that helps. All this, what can pass through the queen excluders and the, and the screens, helps your hive feel like it's thriving. And in our cold, damp springs, this is a better way to work a split. If you want to, again, you can keep a queen cell up here. With the dimmer, you have, it's best to add another queen excluder just to be sure one right above the queen that's laying and then some honey supers and then another one it also makes it easier to find the queen if you choose one or two of those queen cells let them emerge go out on their mating flights then you can find them more quickly snail grow works on the same thing except that it keeps rerouting older bees back down with the funny little doors and uh, if you go back to the July meeting, the presentation, Michael Jaross actually explains it pretty well, what you're doing. This is the cloak board on the bottom, and there's that solid sheet. And when you are going to put the graft in, you slide that solid sheet in, wait a day, put those cells, those eggs that are in the queen cups that you want the young nurse bees to dry out. They recognize that's the grafting frame that represents the grafting frame right there. They realize that they don't, they don't have a queen. It's blocked, the pheromone, and it, it takes very little time for queen pheromone to drop to a level that the bees perceive themselves as queenless. And then, this is wonderful, the cloak board is wonderful because you don't just have a, a builder cell, a builder hive. Once you take the sheet out, it becomes the finisher hive as well. And the queen cannot get up above, and they continue to raise out the queen cells once they start them, the builder phase. So the demerit is the easiest. And 
The method for all of these, separate the queen from most of her brood. Put something in between, usually a queen excluder and honey supers, maybe two, hun two queen excluders with the honey supers in between. When you do this, you prevent swarms because you've lowered the brood nest congestion and the worker bees do not perceive there's brood nest congestion because they've still got room in those honey supers. You keep putting in empty frames in there or drawn out comb this empty and they still have space to work. So swarm control is in place. Honey production is not interfered with. And if you want to, you could either raise out the queen cells on the top, again, going down for the two or three that you want to give them a chance to mate, emerge, mate, and check their mating before you take that those resources off this good thriving hive, before you take five to 10 frames off and stick them someplace else, you can wait and check her laying pattern. She fails, you just get rid of her and start over again, or you can quit. If she's a success, you can now take your nuke off, those frames off, and she is on her brood and going great guns. So that gives you a split if you want to expand your apiary or a nuke you can sell. And if you just want to keep adding honey supers and leave a queen at the top and the bottom, you can increase honey production. So this is this is out of Samatero and Avatavli, the beekeeper's handbook again. It's a great, it, it can be used in so many ways. That's the confusing part about the Demaray. It should have one R hmm, and two E's. I misspelled it on the other one. The cloak board, that sliding board. If you didn't know what grafting was, I put the picture here quickly. It's usually a topic that people get really interested in, maybe their second or third year beekeeping. And you are picking out, with the little teeny tool that woman's using there, you're picking out by sliding this tiny little tool. It's a picture of a grafting tool there. You gotta slide it on just right. You want just hatched eggs. Not eggs, not old. You want barely hatched. They're not even really larger than the egg themselves, right? Because they hatched out of the egg. And you've got to slide under carefully and put them into little tiny cups, which is what that woman's got a, a row of cups there. That's on a bar that you then turn upside down because queen cells are raised upside down. And you put it in a frame. That bar goes into this frame. And then you put that in the top of the cloak board after the, the cover's been in for a day or two. I'm hoping this makes quick sense, at least enough that you get curious enough. You say, well, I could do that. No, I couldn't do that. The Snell Grove, as I said, is a little more complex, and the July monthly meeting recording explains it better. Double screened, so there's not as much pheromone going through at all. That's more separate, but the heat is rising, and a lot of good hive odor, and the buzz, and the feeling that they are a larger, healthy hive. Bees like large numbers. The Apis mellifera does. And then this is this was in the presentation with a one page summary of how to do it. So I've gone through all this and I'm saying this is worth looking at. We need something for Western Washington that really works with our climate, our cool damp springs. The reduced real estate is really attractive. The reduced amount of equipment that you have to buy, store, is specialized for a certain use, can't easily use it for anything else. And the easy recombination, especially the dimmer array, if you decide that queen at the top, you don't want her, and she doesn't mate correctly, you would know right away. Instead of spending two deeps on a, or actually it was one deep, on a uh, drone laying queen, and then I had extra frames that I stored on top, but I stored those resources and they, they were useless. Then I had to get rid of, I had to break the hive apart. So I lost and aged out a bunch of workers who instead of being out foraging, were taking care of drone brood that I didn't want. Not that I don't appreciate what drones do. But it would have been so much easier to say she's a drone layer and get rid of her if I had her at the very top 
of a Demaray system. Also, it's a good way to keep her, to keep an extra queen early in the season and late in the season, although you are probably going to have to do the side-by-side -side to do full overwintering. There are people that make it work. And you're not dependent on out-of-state suppliers. So I'm throwing those ideas out there. And I really like the way the honey production zoomed. Just when I split the queen away from her, a lot of her brood and controlled how much she could lay without the workers thinking that the brood nest was congested. She was trapped but it worked in a way that did not lead to swarming. There was not the congestion feel. So I can stop the recording there. Maybe I'll do that.